And good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are uh, located. Thank you for attending uh, the Cyberproof uh, webinar. We're very excited to have uh, you with us. Uh, this is actually a webinar that we're doing in two parts. So today is uh, an introduction to proactive intr in intruder hunting. Uh, before we get started, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things in case you're not aware. Um, first of all, um, I think there's a good way of you uh, getting some uh, questions. Uh, we will um, have some time for Q&A at the end of the session. So please, uh, um, if you are using the, uh, the chat capability and you're able to use it, then you can certainly ask any questions. Secondly, there is a um, there are a number of uh, attachments and uh, links that that we uploaded for uh, for you. Um, please feel free to to use them. Um, we would very much appreciate uh, you rating this webinar. Um, we would like any feedback. Uh, always always helps us find uh, great content. Um, and the other, final thing to be aware of is that uh, of course. Uh, this session is recorded, so um, you will be able to share it uh, with your colleagues and friends um, later. Uh, so now I'm really excited to be uh, uh, introducing our guest speaker today, um, colleague uh, Bruce Rotan. He is um, the Cyberproof VP uh, for Customer Success. Uh, Bruce has many years of experience uh, in, in uh, the professional cybersecurity world, so uh, I think we're going to be in, in store for a really interesting session. And just one final thing, this is a two-part series, so uh, we will be uh, carrying on uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, take it away, Bruce. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Howard. So just a couple of words of background on myself. Uh, I've been in the IT business, technology business, about 43 years, 10 years as a programmer. Uh, both applications and operating system level code. Then moved into networking, was a network engineer and manager of network engineering for another 10 years. And been in uh, security for a little over 20 years uh, as a network engineer, as a security engineer, then as a manager and then director of solutions architecture, and now uh, global head of customer success. And uh, one other thing is that um, uh, there was once upon a time when I was also a, a, a hacker. So as a former hacker, I have a, a little bit different view of um, a lot of security issues. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I've got my contact info up on the screen on the presentation. So let's kick this off. Uh, again, as, as Howard was saying, this is uh, actually broken into two parts. Um, it was originally developed um, as a half-day seminar on intruder hunting. Uh, let's get started. However, first a word from legal. Uh, this is a solely educational uh, program. Uh, I'll let you read this, but the bottom line net-net is that if you're offended by or don't like something in this presentation, you can sue me, but you can't sue my company. Given that I haven't won the lottery, uh, that's not your fast track to retirement. But let's look at the topics. First, we'll look at intruder hunting, define what it is, why it is, why we would do this type of program, what the program prerequisites are, how to establish the program, develop the scope of the huntscape, and then we'll talk a little bit about the tools that are available. So what is intruder hunting? First off, I'd like to note that it is not the same as threat hunting. Um, a lot of people mis misuse those terms. Uh, intruder hunting is a process for aggressively looking for and evicting intruders in your environment. So I look at it this way. Plans, uh, threat, threats are the planners of mischief. Intruders are the perpetrators of mischief. So that means if you were looking at threat hunting, you'd be looking at external sources, um, individuals that might be planning attacks against your environment, uh, such as if you looked at it as a, as a home uh, intrusion, looking at people who might be casing your home to break in versus setting up uh, detection systems inside your home to find out when somebody's already in. And of course, the premise of this is that preventive controls will never be 100% effective. In terms of basic components, we need to define the scope of the program, uh, a program charter, and then look for job descriptions for the team members. Obviously, we have to implement security baselines and standards. 
select the targets for the huntscape. And if uh, anybody else is on uh, my open mic right now, maybe they put themselves on mute um, or don't pick up the background noise. Um, then look at the uh, selected targets. And picking out your targets is going to be based on a couple of things, risk assessments and threat intelligence. And we're going to talk about those in more detail. Then monitoring those targets based on evidence prediction, and we'll look at how we do evidence prediction. And in section two, more detail about um, plotting out the monitoring systems after we've predicted the evidence. And then also setting intruder traps. We'll identify and report on the intrusions, develop a process for eviction and remediation, and a couple of key points. These have to include recovery point plans. In other words, how much can you afford to lose? So understanding uh, once an attack starts, how far can you let it proceed before you have to begin remediation? And then also reporting trust plan. We'll talk about that in part two, but that's also very critical. So let's look at, look at why we do intrusion hunting and what the end game is. So the real end game of intruder hunting is this. For every attack scenario or type of attack, there's a thing we refer to as the impact curve. And that this one happens to be based on uh, a, an attack using self-replicating uh, ransomware in an environment that has 250 hosts. So the idea here is that for every attack, there's a unique uh, impact curve that says we'll start at some point uh, down here and that if nothing is done about the attack, we'll end up at a maximum impact point. There's also a response window that represents a point in time where if uh, the attack stops, it's within acceptable losses for the organization. So the game of intruder hunting is all about getting our actual response time well within the response window and ensuring that our losses are acceptable to the organization. Now, in terms of some prerequisites, I would say the th first thing you need to do is uh, implement an ISMS or an information security management system. And people frequently ask, well, which one should I use? And the point really is it doesn't matter that much which one you use as long as you implement one and then measure your maturity against it. You could pick ISO, NIST, you could use PCI and essentially replace card member data with stuff I care about and you'd probably be in good shape. You have to get management buy-in, that's essential. You'll need to allocate resources and fund the program, thus the management buy-in, uh, or it will fail. Define the goals, objectives, and charter, aka your policy statements. And then again, identify your maturity and then identify where you want to be in terms of your maturity and set some targets. That's the initiation. In terms of actual practice, uh, the first two steps are absolutely key. Data classification and valuation. Understanding what you have and what value it is, not only to you, but to your potential adversaries. And the next step, obviously, once you understand what data you have, understand where it is and I be able to isolate it. Uh, as a, a friend of mine used to say, you can't protect it if you don't know where it is. And we found that to be very true when I was working at, at Verizon uh, doing breach investigations. Uh, I worked literally hundreds of PCI breach investigations and every, every single one of them where we asked the customer, where's your, where's your PCI data? We were told server A, B, and C right over there. And then we looked for it and found it on DEF underneath somebody's desk. And that's where it got breached usually. So, Knowing where the data is and being able to isolate it is key to success. Next, implement an incident response policy and program, uh, then define the charter for the intruder hunting program, and then figure out a process, come up with a process for monitoring, measuring, and reporting on progress. In other words, a continuous improvement plan. Because if you don't plan on getting better, Odds are you won't. Or in the, the words of the immortal Yogi Berra, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. In terms of the baselining, I first want to point out that intruder hunting is not a substitute for the basic blocking and tackling. In other words, firewalls, IPS, endpoint security, all of the logging, vulnerability scanning across your enterprise. 
that still has to be done. So you'll want to set up those basic blocking and tackling mecha mechanisms and test and validate those. Um, throughout the presentation, I've included some tips, and here's one. Um, do regular penetration but uh, testing, but change your testers regularly because the tools that they use will be consistent, likely as not, if you use the same tester. So you'll want to get new testers with new tools and new techniques and new experience. And also, they will already know certain things about your environment and leverage that, whereas you would prefer to have it be done from a true black box scenario. Next, use external counsel for all of the assessments and pen tests when you can. And this is particularly true uh, for publicly traded organizations. And uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I hate to admit this, but it's, it's really a, a CYA move. The bottom line is if you use external counsel for your pen tests, um, then if something does happen and you haven't had the time to do mitigation and an attack happens and it's successful, at least the evidence that you already knew those vulnerabilities existed is covered by client attorney privilege and therefore non-discoverable. Right. Um, in terms of the data classes, I recommend no more than four classes of data. You can see the examples there. Uh, people try to put in 8, 10, 12 different classifications of data. Their classification scheme and therefore their protections scheme become so convoluted they usually fail at those processes. Once we have all of this in place, then we can set up expanded uh, controls for the targeted systems and look at user account monitoring, memory, disk space, processes, services, network monitoring, and comprehensive log monitoring and, and analytics, and also configuration change monitoring. And we're going to talk about all of the tools involved in, in those processes a little later. Next, we need to look at the scope of the, the program. And the sp scope of the program is going to be based on uh, four key elements. One, the company resources, uh, risk, intelligence, and evidence prediction. We'll talk about each one of those in turn. Uh, you need to define the resources required to operate an effective intruder hunting program. Document your risk assessment findings. That's kind of your course guidance system for targeting the huntscape and finding out which systems you're going to look at. And then leverage threat intelligence, including open source intelligence, industry peer groups, as kind of a fine tuning for your huntscape. And I recommend looking at the vertical industry vertical uh, breach reports that are within your industry, uh, peer groups. Uh, make sure you have connections to local and federal law enforcement uh, because they'll be able to give you good insight uh, on uh, events that are happening in your vertical. And then paid services uh, should certainly be considered. The next step is using negative outcome scenarios. And we'll talk about how to develop those and evidence prediction processes to create the data collection plan. Another tip, who does, ask, who does your CISO report to? Uh, in a lot of organizations, I see that the CISO ends up reporting to the CIO, but that, re, that organizational structure actually creates a conflict of interest. It's probably better to have your top security individual reporting to the CEO or even the CFO or directly to the board. In terms of those company resources, we need to look at things like this. Uh, do you have the internal resources? Do you need to hire people, train people, maybe contract uh, external resources to do the targeting? Uh, how many targets do you have? Generally, it's not, uh, it's not well positioned to try and target more than five or six different systems because of the depth of analysis that you'll be doing and depth of uh, review in the logs. Uh, if you've got more than that, you may want to rotate those every six weeks or so. Another thing to consider is uh, blue team versus red team. So intruder hunting is an aggressive sport. So uh, red team skills are generally well suited, but they're not the only option. The bottom line is you'll need a diverse set of skills uh, people versed in risk management and assessment, 
penetration testing methodology, as well as post-penetration uh, computer forensics, uh, the ability to use those tools and methodologies. We've considered this a specialized function within the SOC uh, and borrow resources from the forensics audit and pen test teams. And the leader of the, uh, in, of the intrusion hunting program should report to the the most senior person uh, in security lead with a dotted line report to the chief legal officer. And when we get into uh, reporting and um, eviction, we'll talk more about why that's really critical. In terms of risk assessment, um, use a standardized risk assessment framework. Uh, for the most part, they're free uh, and they provide a consistent treatment, thus the term standardized. Uh, you can look at the color coding here, and I, I compared a couple of them, NIST and ISO, and they're very similar in their structure. Another thing to note, though, is that risk modeling should have been part, if it, if it isn't, that's something probably to correct, but it should have been part of your enterprise risk register. So don't recreate the wheel if you don't have to. Talk to the chief risk officer, get a copy of the, of the enterprise risk register and pull out the, the critical cyber risk scenarios and use those for assessment and also your evidence prediction process. So let's talk for a moment about, about threats. Um, another widely misused term. Uh, I know this isn't an interactive session, but I ask you to think about the, these questions. Um, are these threats? Is this a threat? Is this a threat? Is this a threat or just a poor fashion judgment? Is malware a threat? The bottom line is I don't consider any of these a threat. Uh, a thumb drive is just a tool. I used to be a certified locksmith within California. These were part of my tool set. Um, and this just is a bad fashion statement. Malware uh, is, um, it depends on use. In the hands of a pen tester, it can help identify vulnerabilities. So malware in and of itself is not a threat. Let me put a finer point on this. Am I a threat? How about now? Here's the point. A threat has to be a combination of three things, a viable threat actor, intent to do harm, and weaponized methodology. It has to have all three. So if one of you in the audience um, had a teenage neighbor that did something that wasn't right, you, uh, you told their parents about it, they got in trouble, that teenager doesn't like you. And maybe he has a baseball bat and he knows where you park your car. He'd be a threat to you, but not to me and not to anyone else in the audience. The point here is that threats are usually fairly personalized as well. So when you're looking at a threat intelligence system, some of the attributes we should be looking for are who's a threat actor, what IP do they have, what geo are they in, what's the name of the organization, um, because if you don't know who they are, you can't look for them uh, talking to your environment. What do they typically do in an attack? What type of scans do they do? What type of phishing do they do? Is malware part of their, their set? Uh, what C2s do they use? Uh, do they use bots? Do they use direct hacking? Uh, how are they targeting you? What are they targeting within your environment? So what data types and what business types do these attackers uh, look for? What tools, techniques, and processes are available to that attacker? What's your best defense against them? And last but not least, what are you exposing about yourself that gives your adversary an advantage? I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, if you look on LinkedIn, quite frequently you'll find people discussing their skill set in LinkedIn, and they'll talk about all of the tools they know, all of the software they're familiar with, and their custom companies listed there. That gives me a pretty good idea of what software they have at that company. So as an aggressor, you've exposed what software you have, and in some cases, what versions. Also, one of the best places I, I used to find in getting intel was Microsoft Help Forums. People would go on to Microsoft Help Forums and they would say, well, I've got this version of the operating system with these patches and I'm trying to put in these, this piece of software and I'm having some problems. Can anybody help me? Thank you. Um, you just told me everything I needed to know about uh, what vulnerabilities you have and how to break into that environment. So next, let's look at 
how we use a threat intel. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about changing the way you think about things. So I have a question. Who's Larry? Um, well, Larry's a bright, outgoing, entrepreneurial kind of guy. Um, when he was in college, he was at the top of his class. He got a degree in biology and molecular chemistry. Everybody expected him to go on to med school, but he took a different path after getting his master's. He graduated with honors in spite of occasional reprimands uh, for organizing environmental protests, and he was actually arrested a couple of times for some unlawful Greenpeace activity. So I want you to ask yourself, what is the most probable current situation for Larry now that he's been out of college for 10 years? He's a director at a clinical hardware manufacturer. He owns a chain of health food stores and is involved in environmental organizations. He works in the retail industry, or Larry is a sales executive for a health insurer. Now, before we get back to Larry, let's ask a different question. Let's suppose you have 10 assets and you gauge all to be of equal value. The last four times the company had an intrusion, the intruders were targeting asset number three. So what is the probability the next intruder will most desire asset at number three? 90%, 75%, 50%? 20, uh, 25%, 10%. Most answers in a live environment, uh, people answer 75, 50%. That's usually the consensus. But I suggest we ask the following questions. Is asset number three the first target that they find when they come in the door? Is it the least well defended and therefore the easiest target? Is all this just a coincidence? And if you had a much larger sample size, you would see that it's really not relevant. Why are you making assessments regarding the desires of strangers? In the end, there's two logic flaws here uh, called belief in small numbers and the availability error. Now, uh, I had to Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman for their work in the psychology of judgment decision-making in situations of uncertainty. But belief in small numbers, uh, people do tend to believe in small sample sizes. And it's like asking somebody, well, I just flipped this coin uh, 10 times and it came up tails every time. What's the probability the next, uh, the next coin flip will be tails? And nine out of 10 people will say, that it's likely to be heads, in spite of the fact that it's still 50-50. And the availability error, and that states that the things that happened, uh, the worst things that happened, the best things that happened to you, and the things that happened most recently are going to be the things that are most available in your memory. And therefore, when you're selecting an answer of possible choices, uh, you'll pick one of the most available things, whether it's right or wrong. Now let's get back to Larry. So I did a little bit of research on uh, relative employment statistics. Sales executives had health insurers, fairly small. Directors at clinic, uh, clinical hardware manufacturers, fairly small. Retail, huge. But here's the interesting thing. Over half of the people who are asked this question say that he's he owns a chain of health food stores and is involved in environmental organizations. Well, that's, that's technically and statistically impossible to be the highest probability because that is located here in the smallest circle, inside the circle on health food stores, inside retail. Again, this is the representative error. Uh, and I put that idea in your mind when I told you things about, about Larry that weren't necessarily relevant to the statistical probability that you were evaluating. What's the whole point of these, these two exercises? The whole point of this is that you're, uh, all of us, as humans, our intuition is terrible. Don't trust intuition. Trust uh, the facts. Trust evidence. And look at the threat intelligence uh, and look at the, look at the attack scenarios um, and don't trust your intuition. Another thing you need to ask, why am I a target? Why am I a target? Well, there are only three types of value. As we know, confidentiality value, integrity value, uh, use value. And there are a lot of different scenarios. But first, understand the value prop of your potential adversary. What might they be going after? Can they make money from you? If someone can make money from you, either through extortion or direct access to digital cash, you're definitely a target, and that's probably what they'll go after. Uh, are you critical infrastructure? 
Are they setting up battlefield preparation for cyber warfare? Uh, are you aligned with someone politically, environmentally, uh, that might cause uh, hacktivists to be interested? And let's face it, some people just want to watch the world, or you specifically burn. These I refer to as digital arsonists. So let's start asking the right questions. First, I would say, let's stop asking the question what your logs and sensors can tell you. That kind of assumes that the designers of the log systems and correlation tools already knew what's important to you and had defined what is suspicious in your environment. And I would say if you haven't defined that, it's kind of unlikely they have. The real question should be, what do I want to look for with my logs and sensors? And getting to that answer is a process that starts with the question, what are the negative outcome scenarios I most want to avoid or what could go wrong? So make a prioritized list. And then uh, I've got a uh, spreadsheet that I can share with, with people who want to get in touch with me offline on how to do that. But for each negative outcome that you want to avoid, you want to identify the following. What's the asset involved? The data servers, location, management environment, um, management environment, the size of, of the uh, environment, the scope, the type of data. What's the business use and purpose of that asset? Include the CIA-based rating for, for the, uh, each asset. And then identify every possible way that outcome could happen. So every scenario that could create that outcome. So let's say, for an example, the outcome is that it's a financial institution and their customer records are exposed on the internet. That's the outcome. Now we have to look at every possible way that could, that could end up being true. Create as many detailed scenarios as you can, then for each scenario, identify the controls that could prevent that event and test them. Are they in place? Do they really work? And then consider the evidence that the, the attacker would create. Uh, do you have detection controls in place that would alert you to that evidence? Do you need to remedy those gaps? Is it tuning or is it a completely new capability? I'll give you an example. Um, a financial institution I was working with, um, they realized that their most likely scenario for data exfiltration was their potentially their own partners uh, getting access to the data, to customer records via their approved application and then exfiltrating that out. And I asked them, if, if how many records do they normally look at? Oh, 10 or 20 customer records at a time. Well, if they created a report with 5,000 records, would that raise an alarm? And the answer was no. So in this case, it was, it's a new capability. Create the alarm that would alert you to that suspicious behavior. And last but not least, for each one of those scenarios, what should your response look like and how fast does it need to happen? And are you able to do that? All of this, by the way, came, came about through a process um, uh, doing consulting work with Janet Napolitano when she was head of Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> she was asking, I was at Verizon at the time, and she was asking that if we could um, take evidence that we had or information that we had as a phone company and provide it to Homeland Security. And I said, obviously, we can't just give you a dump of everything we have. It would be helpful if you could tell me specifically what it is you're looking for. And she wasn't sure. I said, well, let's come up with some scenarios. And we came up with a scenario about how to shut down Los Angeles. Um, and the, uh, in the seminar, I'd go into detail about that or if you talk to me offline. But we basically went through a thought exercise of here's the techniques that a terrorist could use to shut down Los Angeles economically. And then we backed through that and said, okay, if they did these things, here's what evidence they would create, and that's what we then need to go look for. So now that you're asking the right questions, let's look at applying these concepts to intruder hunting. First, use the information from threat intelligence. Who are your most likely adversaries for a given asset that you want to protect? What are the threat capabilities? What exploits are they most likely to use? And when you look at this, we, if we have time, I'll, I'll show you some examples. Uh, if you hit dark websites, find out what uh, malware kits, uh, bot kits are actually available for sale. Uh, that will give you a clue as to the threat capabilities or uh, in the case of a threat intelligence service, someone else can do that for you. 
Also use a tax surface analysis, path analysis, uh, manual and automated red team assault to validate your theories. And then think like an adversary and plan several attack scenarios. And then, as I said before, you want to back through that attack scenario and predict the chain of evidence that would be created by that attack and then set up detectors to look for that specific evidence. Uh, I recommend setting up traps to entice and herd your adversary and position canaries in strategic areas to give you an early warning. The interesting statement that people have made for, for many years is that the uh, attackers have to be right just once. You have to be right 100% of the time, and that's frankly just not true. And here's a reason why. In order to be successful, an attacker, typically, if you're a targeted attack, they're going to do all 11 of these steps, including step zero, which is pre-sales monetization. And this is really important in, in a lot of ways for targeted attacks. Reason, if, if I'm going to attack your environment and I know what assets you have and I, I, I need to figure out who's going to buy them from me once I take them and how much they're going to pay for it, because that will dictate how much I can afford to spend on attacking you, because I may hire contractors as hackers to do some of the work. So I need to be able to do pre-sales monetization. And then there's a process of uh, reconnaissance and discovery, uh, attack strategy and exploit development, getting that initial beachhead, establishing the command and control center at comms, uh, putting in the tools and control software, making sure I gain persistence, um, target acquisition, find the goodies within your environment, then create an exfiltration path, and then this is where they succeed. They capture, encrypt, and exfiltrate, and monetize the assets. But if they don't accomplish all of those, they don't really win the game. And if you can cut, cut the adversary off at step seven or eight, as long as they don't get to nine, you still get to win the game. And the interesting thing is that uh, there are most of these uh, steps are detect involve detectable functions like dark web intel. Are they planning? Are they talking about it? Are they negotiating the sale of your assets? How are they scanning you? What, what information is being posted about you? Uh, are they doing phishing? That can be detected. Malware downloads and correlating these, these items. And then lateral movement, uh, also uh, asset, asset uh, access. And then the C2 comms, and then any anomalous and covert channels that are created. So where do you start? Um, there are a lot of free tools out there, um, and that's mainly where I'm going to focus uh, on the free tools. Um, uh, but this is, let's talk first about the, the areas that you're going to have to explore. Uh, threat intelligence, obviously, we talked about that. Uh, DNS monitoring and analysis, we can find a lot of useful information there. Network monitoring and analysis, reconnaissance monitoring. Uh, how, are they, how are they trying to do reconnaissance? How are they scanning you? And it might not just be scanning. There's a lot of other, other areas that we can talk about. Uh, intruder traps, uh, honeypots and deception networks, log monitoring and analysis, memory monitoring and analysis, disk monitoring, searching the registry for persistence, uh, process and system monitoring, uh, looking at the system services, uh, application logs, and any purpose-built uh, investigation triggers. Again, like I pointed out before, looking at, are my partners running reports of my customer data uh, of excessive size? Uh, deriving threat intelligence to define and focus that that huntscape, in other words, big data analytics. And I know that some of you are probably already thinking, this is a, a tremendous amount of work and very much in depth, and why do I really need to go to this level? And you're, some of you are probably thinking, well, this is the level of, of effort that you would expect to, to see when you're battling state-sponsored attackers. And I'm not likely to be attacked by those people. But here's the problem. The tools they use are out there. I'll give you a few examples. So what happens when governments weaponize cyber? Well, it started with Stuxnet that was reverse engineered and commoditized. So 
the basic code for that was actually turned into a weapon. Um, NSA's equation group, 8200, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, uh, PLA Unit 61398, uh, the Iranian Cyber Army, all of these folks develop, uh, have aggressor teams and they're developing malware. The problem is they can't keep it secret. Um, the CIA's uh, and, and NSA's malware vault got released um, and then things of course got worse. And one of the great examples of how much worse is what I call firmware rootkits um, or resident evil. Old school rootkits were installed in the boot sector and these, but these rootkits are installed right on the motherboard firmware. Um, and it's a great place to hide. For example, if I take the firmware chip that is used for the video driver and put malware into that, insert malware into that, odds are no one's ever going to find it. And at the end of the day, you're not gonna rip that chip out of the motherboard. So putting it in the firmware means that you have to essentially replace some motherboard. Uh, that's why the graphics, these things are, like I said, zombie hard to kill, and they are a replacement for the, of the motherboard. The rootkit docs were leaked uh, in CIA Vault 7, um, and Fancy Bear released one that apparently weaponized existing LoJack commercial code. So the bottom line is the, the nation state sophisticated software is available. And here's some of the places it's available. Actually, these, both of these were shut down late last year, um, uh, as well as Alpha Bay and a couple of other sites, but many, many others spring up in their place. But these are great examples. If you look at this one, Dream Market, um, hacking, 793 ads, services, 5,700 ads, um, digital goods, drugs, drug paraphernalia, but the services down here and other. There are hacking kits of almost any, any variety you can imagine. The same thing was over here on, uh, on Wall Street. Uh, if you look at the list of entries in this dark website, um, that's it's pretty it's pretty amazing actually the amount of, of software you can get and an interesting thing about it it's become kind of a business in that um, the the software now you don't just buy it you can actually license malware to attack someone and it's really interesting because it, it tracks how many times how many systems you've used this to break into so if you hit your, your end of your licensing, they'll want to get more Bitcoin from you before you can continue attacking other organizations. So it's a very sophisticated business. Uh, before we uh, end, I want to go through a little bit of defining suspicious. I talked about some about evidence um, creation and evidence prediction. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, looking for suspicious in your environment before we wrap this up. First, I'll say that spotting the obvious can be a pretty good thing. Um, this uh, actually, some of you may have seen this slide in other contexts and uh, had a different S word on the bottom of the slide. Uh, even with the disclaimer, my, my legal team wouldn't buy into that. Um, at any rate, the, the concept though of spotting the obvious in this next slide, when I go through these, you'll probably say, well, Bruce, yeah, some of these are pretty obvious, but I'll ask a better question. Are you doing those things? And in spite of the fact that we're, they're obvious, I find that most organizations are not. So you can't look for suspicious until you define suspicious in the context of your environment. Are there are rare outbound block packets corrected behavior? What do I mean by that? You, you get a firewall alert that says um, this user system um, was blocked by the firewall this one time, and then we didn't ever see any problems again. So obviously that, that person stopped trying to do what they were doing that, you shouldn't, that they shouldn't be doing, right? Or that person's system was compromised, it made an attempt to phone home, it hit the firewall, and then uh, used an algorithm to find a better way through, and now is talking out uh, to its command and control center with no problems at all. What's the normal behavior of my target system? Can I create heuristics based on that behavior? Um, especially things like its communications. Um, I'd ask, 
what's a normal behavior of that system? Does it talk to anyone outside of this network? Um, should it ever talk to anyone outside of this network? In other words, was it okay that your payroll server woke up this morning and decided that it should talk to somebody on the internet? Where is data XXX supposed to live and have you seen it anywhere else? Uh, can I go back to that PCI data or should uh, unencrypted health da healthcare data be on your network anywhere? Exactly who should be accessing those data stores? Should the guy in the mailroom be able to access the, the, the payroll server or the HR server? Should whatever type of data be traversing your network at all? Again, think about uh, unencrypted healthcare data or maybe proprietary designs, uh, CAD drawings that are unencrypted. Should that you be seeing those? Do you have a business partner in Seychelles? Um, I bring that up because I had a uh, customer a couple, several years ago and we were seeing communications to Seychelles and he said, uh, well, I don't see anything terribly wrong with that. I'm like, well, except for the fact that it's a tiny island off the coast, coast of Somalia and pretty much the only thing is there are resorts and money laundering and proxy sites for criminals in Eastern Europe. So if you're talking to someone there, that could be a problem. Uh, another customer I was working with, I did a NetFlow analytics on their environment and found they were talking to somebody in Pakistan. I asked them about that. They said, well, we used to have a partner there. We, we fired them. I said, well, the communications indicates there's ESP packets, so it's a VPN. Your VPN's still up. So look for the communications processes. Are there a few systems in your environment that are perfectly patched? Did you do that? Because I'll tell you that if a hacker hits a, hits a target and they acquire that target, uh, as a former hacker, the first thing I would do is patch that asset to the nines. The reason? Well, I don't want some other hacker to come in and take it from me. I want to patch it and make sure that I own it. So there are those, those systems in your environment that are perfectly patched, you have to ask, did you do that? Uh, should that communications channel really be encrypted? Um, encrypted channels are great and they're terrible. They hide information from you, uh, but they provide privacy and security. But looking at encrypted channels going to a location in China when you're not supposed to be talking to someone there. Why is there a Telnet session running on port 25? Um, and this is uh, actually another true example. Uh, I was working with a customer um, and they were being a little bit slow on getting my pen test contract done. So I teleted to port 25 on their email server and got the little angle bracket. And I sent an email from the person that was holding my contract to his boss and said, hey, these guys are really good at this pen testing service. We should probably speed up their contract and get them signed up. Uh, which happened, his boss called him and said, yes, I'll sign it. And he called me five minutes later asking, how did you do that? I said, it'll be in the pen test report. But the bottom line is you can, you can, use, you can abuse protocols pretty easily. Uh, so look for those protocol abuses. Are you old enough to be talking to me? Consider domain ages. If you're talking to a domain that was created within the past 48 hours, there's probably a problem with that. And then also look for the outliers. The, the bulk of the information you're going to find up on the main 80% is interesting sometimes, but the things get really interesting out at uh, three sigma either direction, the point, point 0.2%. Uh, that's where the, the outliers are and that's where the anomalous behavior is. Another thing to consider is, did you just discover an expendable asset? Let's say you, you find a system and it's doing things that are hinky and you've concluded that it's a compromised asset. Should you run in and flatten that system and go to rebuild it? I would ask, have you, have you discovered an expendable asset? As, uh, as a former hacker and familiarity with those techniques, the, typically what a person will do is they'll collect several assets, they'll gain persistence, and then they'll use one of those assets that they think they can afford to lose to try and build a, an exfiltration path to see if you noticed. So when you first notice a system trying to exfiltrate data, you need to find out 
um, I will talk about this in the um, in the eviction process exactly how to go about this but you you need to consider whether or not it's an expendable asset and there are other assets talking to it and other assets owned by the intruder within your environment and lastly again we've talked about this earlier someone offering to sell your data looking for that pre-monetization is very helpful if you're a targeted uh, uh, a targeted victim. And with that, we'll wrap this up. Uh, we'll go into part two and we'll talk about the specific tools, things to look for, where to look, and then the how to report on an intrusion, and then the eviction, the specifics of the eviction process, all of that in part two. I hope uh, all of you can join. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Bruce. That was uh, really, really uh, both entertaining and interesting. Uh, actually, one one question did come in, if uh, if I may. Um, you spoke a, a little bit about your experience as a as a as a hacker. Um, do you feel that uh, ethical hacking hacking is a source for good, or does it do harm as well? What's your view on that? Well, um, I'll make I'll make a couple of statements about that. One. Um, my time as a hacker was some time ago, um, um, uh, I think statute of limitations a long time ago. Um, the other point I'll make is back when, when, when I was a hacker, we didn't consider it, we didn't, we didn't consider it, uh, a bad thing because we weren't trying to steal anything. I never stole anything from anyone or destroyed any systems. It was exploration. And in those days, we had a different view of it. Um, then came people trying in the, in the late 90s, people breaking into websites so they could deface the website and brag about what a Uber hacker they were by putting their name on their, their handle on a website. And then the 2000s hit and everything changed. It was all about the money. Can okay? you break in and steal from somebody? So ethical hacking, uh, I am a certified ethical hacker and white hat hacking. I think that I think that the skill sets there are uh, are and can be used for good, and that they help discover vulnerabilities. And uh, I can't imagine anybody saying that a, a pen tester is a, is a bad thing and getting your systems pen tested. It's it's your. I don't say that it's a thing you should do without cause, but if you believe your systems are tight and everything's good, uh, then then pen test it. To be sure. Also, if you have regulatory compliance that says thou shalt get pen tested, well, there's there's your second reason for doing it. And the last reason for doing a pen test is you go to senior management and they say, well, we don't have the money for this, we're not going to fund it, and you're trying to tell them, but we're really vulnerable. Have a pen test done and prove it. And then you have hard evidence to take back to senior management to get funding for those uh, security projects that you that you need to shore up those vulnerabilities. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that was that was a great uh, great insight. Thank thank you. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna call that a, a wrap now. Um, just again, remind everybody we we do have a part two. So uh, that if you look at the attachments um, with this uh, webinar, you can see the link there. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, soon. Thank you very much, Bruce. Again, and uh, have a good day. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye.